Well, good morning. How are you guys doing? Yeah, you're doing good? Well, here we are with the brand new year, 2023. Are you excited? Are you happy that 2022 is behind you? Yeah, I know. Me too, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not like we've experienced any major event in this past year, but I feel like the last few years we've all been kind of bracing and are holding our breath for another wave of whatever, right? And I'm so thankful that it never came. And so I am excited about this brand new year and the potential and the possibilities we have. It's like we have this, you know, clean blank slate in front of us. But before we rush off, you know, to fill up our year and with our New Year's resolutions and that kind of thing, as a church, we're actually, actually going to be spending some time fasting and praying together. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But, you know, we want to be intentional about this because God says that he has plans for us. And so we want to take some time to seek his face and to hear his heart, to figure out what it is that he has for us in this coming next year. And so, you know, we're going to park for just a few moments and talk about the, uh, the place that fasting has, the role that it has with the believer. You know, fasting is mentioned in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In fact, in the Old Testament, uh, the Jewish people were commanded to fast. They were to fast one day every year on the Day of Atonement. And that was the day that the um, high priest was able to go into the holies of holies and he'd bring in a lamb, you know, to sacrifice it for the sins of the people. And all the people fasted, identifying with the priest and that sacrifice for the forgiveness of their sins. But you know, when we look into the New Testament, there's no such command. However, it is, is expected that this discipline from the Old Testament would be carried on into the New Testament. In fact, Jesus talked about fasting all throughout the Gospels. We find he mentions fasting in Matthew 6.16. He says this. He says, moreover, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites with the sad continents, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to be men to be fasting. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. Did you notice that he said, when you fast, not if you fast? Because again, this was a discipline that was carried over from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And so it was expected that these believers would continue some of these practices that they were accustomed to in the Old Testament. You know, in fact, there's this principle that I learned in Bible school. And we learned that many of the things were passed into the New Testament from the Old, and it was expected that we would um, practice them exactly as it was unless Jesus came up with some more teaching and some more instruction, you know, to shift that practice. For instance, take tithing, for example. That can be controversial nowadays. Tithing is an Old Testament practice. But it was Old Testament that was carried on into the New Testament. And that's why in the New Testament, you don't find anywhere where it says to give 10% because Jesus wasn't correcting that practice that they used to do. He was expecting them to continue to tithe. Jesus does talk about giving, and he adds another layer when he talks about giving. And he says, don't get all caught up with, you know, 10% of this, 10% of that. He says, be generous with you give, because God has blessed us so much, and he's been generous with us. And so there's no new teaching on tithing, so it's expected that we would continue with this Old Testament practice. And then there's keeping the Sabbath holy. That was something that was shared with the Ten Commandments, right? But Jesus did bring some new teaching to this because of the way that the Pharisees had made it so legalistic. They had put a burden upon the Jewish people. In fact, they were not allowed to do anything, any kind of work, or it could cost them their life. And to work on the Sabbath in those days could be anything from walking down the street, to lighting a fire, to cooking, to carrying something. Anything that exerted energy was considered to be working, and therefore you could be punished, you could be put to death for that. And you remember how they treated Jesus when he did miracles on the Sabbath? They were indignant, right? How dare he do a miracle? How dare he open up the blind eyes and heal their feet? I mean, you have all these other days. You have six days of the week. You could do your miracles then. His miracles were lost on the Pharisees. And so Jesus had to bring correction to this. And he did when he said, listen, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so this is the principle, and the same with fasting. We don't see a new command with fasting in the New Testament, but it's expected that Jesus' disciples would continue this uh, practice because of the power that it gives us when we're praying. 
We just read one of our passages where Jesus talks about fasting. If we were to skip down to chapter 9, he, he mentions fasting again. He says this. It says, Jesus states, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. So just to give you some context around this scripture, you know, John the baptizer's disciples had practiced fasting, and they noticed that Jesus' disciples hadn't. And so they called Jesus out on it. And what did Jesus say? He said, oh, well, they don't need to fast as long as I am here, as long as the bridegroom is with them. But when I'm taken away, in that day, they will fast. If you were to continue reading a few more verses there in Matthew 9, this is where Jesus begins to talk about the new wine. And he says, you can't pour new wine into an old wineskin. And that new wine is talking about revelation. It's talking about hearing the voice of God. It's talking about intimacy with Jesus. And so he's giving us a template here that now we will fast because Jesus is not with us physically. And so this template represents hunger and the longing that we have for our bridegroom. And so when we fast, we're, we're saying, Lord, we want a fresh revelation. We want to see you at a deeper level. And, you know, as a church, we can't go into this new year with last year's wine, with last year's manna. It's just going to cut it. And so we're going to talk about some of the ways that we're going to fast together in this month. We also see the apostles in the early church fasted for spiritual purposes. We see one example in Acts chapter 13, verses 2 to 3, and it says this. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. So we can see that fasting is a spiritual principle that the Old Testament believers did and same with the New Testament believers. They practiced fasting. Sometimes they fasted for personal reasons. Other times they did corporate fasts for very specific causes. And as we look into scripture, we can find at least 10 different types of fasts, and it describes these fasts in different passages. We find the disciples fast. You might want to uh, write these down. I'm going to go through all 10 of them just very briefly. If you're interested in studying this a little bit later, you can ask me for my notes, and I'd gladly give them to you. So the disciples' fast is found in Matthew 17, 21, and this fast is for self-denial. It's for the release of besetting sins and addictions. If you're struggling with something, you don't know how to get free, fasting for a meal or two or a day or two might help you to get free of these things that won't seem to let go, you know, of your life. Then there's the Ezra fast, and that's found in Ezra 8.23. This fast was for solutions. They had a problem, and they needed answers. They needed this problem solved, and so they fasted for wisdom. And if you go look that up, God gave them great wisdom for their situation. There's the Samuel fast, and that's found in 1 Samuel 7.6. They fasted for revival and for soul winning. There's the Elijah fast. That's found in 1 Kings 19, 4 to 8. And this fast was to heal the mental and the emotional problems, just like the mental illness, you know, that um, 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 Elijah had experienced when he suffered from depression. There's the widow's fast, and that's found in 1 Kings 17, 16. And this was to care for the poor and to meet the humanitarian needs of others. There's the St. Paul fast, and that's found in Acts 9.9. And this was to fast for insight, to make crucial decisions. And then Daniel's fast. There's actually two types of Daniel's fast. The first one we see is Daniel 1.8, and this is for physical health when he did a 10-day fast. The second one is Daniel 10.1 to 14, and this he fasted for spiritual breakthrough. The John the Baptist fast is found in Luke 1.15, and this was to be set apart for a mission. And finally, the Esther fast, which is found in Esther 4.16 and 5.2, and this was for God's protection for the nation. So, you know, I would say that the most common fast that we're probably all familiar with is the Daniel fast. I've talked about it in different messages that we shared about how he fasted for 10 days for physical health, right? And so the Daniel fast has actually gained popularity throughout the years, especially recently, where individuals and churches and groups have been adopting this type of fasting in order to get their bodies healthy. In fact, I'm sure most of you know who uh, Rick Warren is. 
he's a speaker, he's a pastor, well, he used to be a pastor, he's just retired, and uh, he was a pastor of multi-campus churches, and so thousands of people in his churches across the nation in the States, and he discovered uh, one day that most of, a lot of his people in his congregations were unhealthy, and so he wrote a book on the Daniel Fast, and actually he wrote a whole program called the Daniel Program. And then he promoted it to his congregation. And, you know, 15,000 people signed up to complete this program. And they made a vow and they did this program within a year. And those 15,000 people collectively lost 260,000 pounds together. Can you imagine that? And they also reported of fasting this type of Daniel fast. Many of them were healed of different chronic diseases like diabetes and other such illnesses. And so the Daniel fast has become quite popular. You know, it's one way that we fast for physical health. In fact, we're hearing a lot about intermittent fasting, right? Maybe some of you have tried that type of fasting, as science tells us about the benefits that intermittent fasting can have on our body. So there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of people talking about fasting for physical health. However... As I mentioned, that there's the second type of fast that Daniel did. He took the same 10-day fast, and he fasted for 10, 21 days for spiritual breakthrough. We don't hear a lot about fasting for spiritual breakthrough, and yet we have a template here in Daniel's life. And so we want to park just a little bit, and we want to talk about fasting and how we can fast for our spiritual breakthrough as well. And we want to look at three keys from Daniel's life, and we want to consider these keys that will help us when we are considering and praying through for spiritual breakthrough. And these keys are, number one, we want to look at his burden. Number two, we want to look at his vow. And number three, we want to look at his prayer. So I'm going to start reading Daniel chapter 10. And there's 14 verses there. So if you can kind of track with me. I think it's important that I read all 14 because we're just going to unpack a few after that. But it'll help us to put it in context. And it'll help you better understand what's going on here with Daniel and these three keys. So I'm going to begin reading in chapter 10, verse 1. It says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar. And a word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word, and he had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like burl, and his face was like the appearance of lightning, and his eyes like flaming torches, and his arms and legs like a gleam of burnished bronze. And the sound of his words were like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and I heard the sound of his words. I fell on my face in a deep sleep within my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God. Your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and I came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. Did you guys get all that? <laughs> okay, so we're going to unpack a little bit here, and we want to look at the first key was his burden. In verse 2, he says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. So in verse 1, Daniel had received this vision and understanding of this vision. And the vision was, the interpretation was, that there was great conflict that was going to come to the Babylon city. And when he heard this, it says he mourned. 
He mourned upon hearing this. The word mourned means to lament. It means to grieve. It means to be burdened. And the reason why he was burdened, because he heard of the condition that was coming upon Babylon, and also because of the condition of the hearts of the Jewish people. You see, two years before he received this vision, Cyrus had um, decreed and had said that now it was going to be law that the Jewish people were allowed to return to Jerusalem. They had been in captivity for so long, but now they're allowed to go back to their country. But you know, not many of them took him up on this offer. Because the majority of them had become so accustomed to their living conditions and they had be, become desensitized, you know, to the Babylonian pagan ways. And so Daniel mourned for them because he was concerned that if they remained in Babylon, then they would suffer great calamity, just like, you know, the Babylonians. And so he has this burden for his people. And because of this burden, he makes a vow to abstain from certain things for 21 days. 21 days is a long time to give something up, you know? If you don't believe me, ask someone who's tried to quit smoking or give up coffee or give up sugar. It can be brutal, especially because we are creatures of habits, you know, and our body wants what it wants. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and sometimes our body will go into fits because it's going through maybe withdrawals. Have you ever had uh, a headache, you know, from caffeine or from sugar? And, and then what do we do? We go back to the very thing we're trying to stay away from uh, just to get rid of the pain. And so we go back to the substances that we're trying to give up. Oh, you might be able to give something up for maybe a meal or two, knowing that that thing is within your reach. But if you're going to do any kind of fasting for an extended period of time, say maybe three days or seven days or 21 days like Daniel did, you're going to need something that's greater than desire. You're going to need strength from something that is more powerful than willpower. And we see that the burden provides the strength that we need. When Daniel tapped into a burden for, uh, for his people, then he was able, you know, to make this vow and to commit himself to 21 days. You know, last November I did some fasting. I actually fasted for 21 days. And I have to tell you, it was the hardest thing I've done physically. God had put a burden on my heart for two situations um, that I'm aware of, and they were desperate situations. And so he gave me a burden for these situations. And I have to say, you know, um, the first two weeks I fasted only water, and then that last week I added juice and broth just to help me to get through with some of my responsibilities. And um, I learned a lot in that fast. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about what we go through physically. I, I discovered that on the fourth day, your hunger actually shuts down. And so hunger is no longer the issue. But then what happens is your body goes through a detox process. And so there was a lot of pain that I experienced in my body, especially in your legs. For some reason, we carry toxins in our legs. So I had a lot of pain. I had a lot of weakness. And that disappears usually by the seventh day. And then all I was left with was this um, agonizing weakness. You know, I couldn't even do a flight of stairs. Just going up the stairs, I had to sit down because I felt like I was having a heart attack. You know, my heart was beating so quickly. But here's the thing. Because God put that burden on my heart, that was the only way that I was able to finish my fast because the weakness was also so painful. But when I felt that weakness, I was reminded of how weak I am. I am mortal. And I had, I, there was nothing I could do to change these two situations. And so my weakness reminded me that God is, is so powerful and he is strong when we are weak. And it helped me to be able to press in and to pray for these two situations. Now, you know, I don't usually tell people I'm fasting when I am fasting, when it's personal. When it's corporal, of course, we're doing that together because we just read where Jesus says, you know, don't tell anybody, wash your face or you're going to get your reward by people knowing. But I just wanted to share that with you today to just emphasize the importance of having a burden. Willpower is not going to get, you know, cut it for you. We need the burden of the Lord. And that's how we're able to finish our fast and, and fulfill our commitment to the Lord. So Daniel fasted for 21 days because of the burden that he picked up for his people. And we see this in the life of Nehemiah. 
Do you remember who Nehemiah was? Nehemiah was a governor in the land. And he heard one day about the people that had been in exile. They had come into some trouble. He also heard that the walls had been broken down and that the city gates had been fired. And so if you go read that story there, it says he mourned the same word that we see with Daniel. He got a burden for the people and he mourned and he fasted and prayed until he got a word from the Lord. So we need the burden of the Lord if we're going to, you know, fast for any length of time. Because fasting actually triggers the body, you know, and the body's not going to go lightly. The body, it wants what it wants. And just as I mentioned before, we don't know how bad we crave things. And we don't know how addicted we become, you know, to certain things that we consume until we give it up or until uh, it's taken away from us. And so we're going to need to fast in order. Uh, We're going to need to get the burden of the Lord in order to uh, complete our fast. So then what is a burden exactly? Well, a burden from the Lord is simply tapping in to the heart of God and feeling what he feels, which is actually really encouraging because when God gives you a burden for something, that lets you know that God wants to see that situation changed, right? The burden comes from God. It originates with God, and he's allowing us to feel that burden so that we can become a part of the solution, so that we start to contend in prayer for the answer that we need for the very thing that we're burdened for. We see a powerful example in Jesus' life and how he tapped into a burden of the Lord. You know, one of Jesus' best friends was Lazarus, and Jesus had been away somewhere, and he had heard that Lazarus had died. He heard that from Mary, who was Lazarus' sister. Mary was weeping. Some of the other Jewish people were weeping over the death of Lazarus. And when Jesus heard this, it says that he groaned in spirit, and he was deeply moved. Now, we really need to research these words to understand what was going on with Jesus here. Because Jesus didn't mourn the way that we mourn at a funeral over someone that we loved. No, in in the uh, pictures of the New Testament, that word, uh, deeply moved, is actually an old verb. And what it means is to snort like a horse. Imagine that. What does that mean? Jesus was deeply moved. He was feeling a burden from the, from the Lord, and he was feeling this righteous indignation. There was this anger inside of his, his spirit because he understood that it wasn't Lazarus' time to die. It wasn't his time to go. It was a premature death. And Jesus picked that up, and he was angry that death had come for Lazarus. And as he allowed that burden to stir inside of him, he prayed out of that burden, and he commanded Lazarus to come forth. And Lazarus came forth. You see, God has emotions, but his emotions are always in line with who he is. He doesn't have knee-jerk reactions to his emotions like we do, right? Somebody says something or we hear something and we have a knee-jerk reaction. We get mad or we burst out with laughter, whatever that is. Our emotions are fickle. God's emotions line up with who he is. It lines up with his righteousness and his justice. And so when we pick up a burden from the Lord, we get a different perspective. We get an eternal perspective. And here's the thing. A burden is not the same thing as being concerned or being worried or being anxious about something. And it's really important that we don't confuse the two. Because when it's a genuine burden for God, we get this unusual compassion. It's an unselfish compassion for somebody else and their situation. It's unselfish in the way that it doesn't affect you in any way, and whether their, you know, their situation changes has nothing to do with you, but you receive this compassion knowing that only God can intervene into their situation. And so it causes you to go to the Lord and to pray for that person. And it's also um, personal, meaning that a lot of the burdens that we will pick up will be for our children or our spouse or our church family or our country or our nation, just like Daniel did when he picked up a burden for his people. So, you know, here's the thing, that we are spirit beings, right? The Bible says that those who worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. So we pick up a burden on our spirit. But if we do not pray that burden through, then our flesh will work it out and it'll manifest. And it'll manifest as worry and concern and anxiety and stress and those kind of things. Because our bodies were not created to carry burdens. We weren't wired that way. Our spirits were. And so when we pick up a burden from the Lord, then we take it into prayer 
and we press in until we feel that burden lifted. And that's what keeps us from worry and anxiety and those kind of things. Remember our passage in the epistle says that we're to worry about nothing but to pray about everything. And so when we receive a burden from God, we're to take it into that place of prayer. And so Daniel was given a burden, and this burden um, allowed him to last 21 days to pray for his people. And so that is the first key, is Daniel's uh, burden, and that was a key to spiritual uh, breakthrough. The next thing that we want to talk about is his vow, and his vow is found in verse 3. He said, I ate no delicacies, uh, which in the Hebrew is desirous, and I want you just to think about that for a moment because we're going to come back and unpack that word right there. But he said, I ate no delicacies, neither came flesh, which was meat, or wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So Daniel made us a vow to himself and to God what he was going to give up. In this situation, he gave up sweets and carbs and meat and, and wine, and he didn't even bathe. He didn't even allow himself the luxury of making his body feel comfortable by bathing for three whole weeks. Because remember, the whole point of fasting is that we're denying ourselves something. We deny ourselves something so that we can give more of ourselves to God, right? James 4, 8 says, when you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. And so when you choose to give something up, and we say that we're going to um, do uh, without something, you know, that becomes a sacrificial offering. And we add that to our prayers. And here's the really cool thing. As I just mentioned that that word delicacies in the Hebrew means desirous. Well, when we keep reading to verse 11, remember when the angel of the Lord showed up and he addressed Daniel and he said, oh, greatly loved. Well, that phrase greatly loved in the Hebrew is the exact same word desirous. So when Daniel gave something up that was pleasant, gave something up that he desired, it attracted God to him. It didn't attract God to him because of, you know, works. We don't, you, we don't fast to try to get God to do something for us. It attracted God to him because of the sacrifice he was making. It's the intent of the heart. So when we choose to give something up, something that we desire, something that's pleasant, you know, it's attracting to God. We get his attention. We get his desire. And what does the Bible say? That the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ear is attentive to our prayer. So we get the ear of the Lord when we bring that offering, that sacrifice along with our prayers. And you know, food is not the only thing that you can fast. Maybe some of you are here today and you're, you can't fast food. Maybe you have diabetes. Maybe it's, you know, something to do in your body. There are many things that we can fast. There are many things that we crave and that bring us pleasure, right? We can give up social media, for instance. How many of you are on social media a lot and probably stand to give up a little bit of that? We can give up entertainment. We can give up gaming. You know, anything that is a sacrifice becomes that offering that we add to our prayers. I don't know if many of you recognize the name Lou Engel. He wrote a book on fasting, and he shared his experience with what the Lord, the burden that the Lord had given him, and the fast that the Lord had put him on. Well, Lou Engel had this burden in, in 2004, and the Lord wanted him to raise up uh, a younger generation, young adults, and commit themselves that they would fast and pray for 50 days and 50 nights. And so while he was doing that, and while he was praying about that, and while he was organizing this event that the Lord had asked him to do, he met a young man, and his name was Brian Kim. And this young man actually became a part of the event and was helping them, and he actually became his uh, spiritual son. And so Brian King became a part of that, and in the, the, one of the very first meetings that they had, there was only 50 to 70 young people that gathered together, and they were fasting for the end of abortion. And they were also fasting, and they were praying to God that they would have a pro-life president and pro-life judges. Well, that is called the call, that event, and it's continued on since then, and now there's thousands and thousands of young adults and, and other adults that have joined that, um, that movement. Well, during that time, though, this young man, Brian Kim, 
he decided that God had put a burden on his heart and that he made a, a commitment. And it was, he actually made a Nazarite vow. And that's found in the Old Testament. I won't unpack that right now. But he vowed that he was going to give up sweets and meats. And so it's similar to the Daniel fast, you know. And he did that for a while. And then when President Bush was elected, he decided that his Daniel fast was finished. That actually lasted two years for him of giving up meats and sweets. But that was his vow that he made and he, so that he could give more of himself to God in prayer. Well, at the end of uh, when President Bush was elected, he decided that, okay, I'm done then. And he told the Lord, you know, I'm going to break my fast. I've done it as, as long as I said I would. He says, unless you tell me that I should continue to fast. And so he said, Lord, you're going to have to give me a sign. And so he was a college student, and that day that he uh, was the last day of his fast, he went to school, and he went into the library at school, and they were having a study hall. And there was another young man there that he had never met before. And so he introduced himself to him, and he says, hello, my name's Brian Kim. And the other man said, oh, hello, my name's Daniel Fast. What are the odds? Running into someone named Daniel Fast. Have you ever met someone named Daniel Fast? I mean, this, man, this young man ended up being a, a Jewish believer. And so that was a sign to him that he was to continue this fast. And so he continued to the fast longer. And what ended up happening was he had a dream around that. There's a lot of layers to the story. He had a dream around that time. And this dream that he had actually was a confirmation of a prophetic word that he had from Cindy Jacobs a couple years before he had this dream. And this prophetic word that Cindy Jacobs gave him was that God was raising him up as an Ezekiel type of prophet who was going to do prophetic acts and raise up a different breed of a generation, his generation. Well, he didn't like that word because how many have read the book of Ezekiel? There's some strange things that Ezekiel was asked to do that I think most of us would run screaming if God had put that on us. But his, in his dream that he had, he dreamed that there was thousands of young people that are emerging upon Washington, D.C. And there was another man in his dream, and this other young man had um, duct tape, red duct tape across his mouth with the word life. And so they took that as a sign, as what Cindy Jacob was talking about, that they needed to do this. This was the prophetic sign like Ezekiel. And so they did that. They went out and they bought this red duct tape and they wrote the word life across their mouth. And uh, they were so blessed by what took place. But but what they didn't expect was the way that the media reacted to them. Now, this is back in 2004, and the media caught wind of this, and they splashed this all across their magazines and the news. I don't know if internet was really going at that time, but everywhere there was publication, they showed this uh, life uh, image. And every time that life image was being splashed across the media, they were prophesying life. And because of this, he went on to start a new movement called Bound for Life, and it exists today. And there's over 240 chapters across the nation where young adults and people gather together still with this tape, prophesying life. And they have bound themselves to a vow, to a commitment that they won't stop praying for the pre-born babies and that they would continue to repent on behalf of the sins of the nation. And that's amazing, right? You just don't know what God will do with our fast. We can't take our vow lightly because we don't know all that God will accomplish, but we know that he uses us. And sometimes we have to fast in order to press in and to have these kind of results. You know, I just want to say, though, that there is no condemnation for breaking a fast. I've been saved since I was 15 years old. I'm not going to tell you my age, but you can figure it out. So I have done a lot of fasting, and I have broken a lot of fasts in my day too, and I've never felt condemnation ever. Sometimes I felt sad that I didn't follow through on my fast because then I didn't experience the spiritual breakthrough that I was fasting for, but I never felt condemnation. And we actually see this as an example in the Bible. You know, um, there was a time when Jesus had sent out his disciples and he sent them out two by two. He says, okay, now you're going to go out into the world and you pray for the sick and you heal them and you deliver them. He gave them his authority and his name. So his disciples came across this one man one day and he was demon possessed. So they said the same words that Jesus had said. They prayed exactly the same way that Jesus had prayed. They prayed in his name, but nothing happened. And so later on, when they got with Jesus, they were processing their experience. And they said, why couldn't we deliver that man just like you did? And what did Jesus say to them? He didn't say, well, because you're not me. You know, he didn't say, because you're not holy enough. What did he say? 
He said, these kind of results do not come except for prayer and fasting. And so there are times when prayer isn't enough and we need to add fasting to our prayers. And I think the reason that we need to add fasting to our prayers is found in our third key as we look at Daniel's prayer. So we'll pick up in verse 10, and he says this. He said, And behold, a hand touched me and sent me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, manly, greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. So this is such an interesting passage. The thing that popped out at me right away was the fact that the angel, you know, says to Daniel, although you fasted and prayed for 21 days, the very first day that you humbled yourself and prayed to God, God heard you. But the angel couldn't get to Daniel because he was held up in spiritual warfare with the, with the prince of Persia. Now, most uh, Bible interpreters believe that the Prince of Persia was a fallen angel and had jurisdiction over this area. But don't miss, you know, what this passage is revealing. It's such an important part of Scripture because it's reminding us that we're all in a spiritual battle, right? Paul tells us this in Ephesians 6.12. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so sometimes, you know, we, we don't see the answers to our prayers the first or the second or third time because of the spiritual warfare that is surrounding our prayers. And because, you know, we don't recognize that we're in a battle and we maybe don't understand spiritual warfare, then we back off and we stop praying for the thing that we have a burden for. And the problem with that is then we start to justify it, right? And we make all kinds of excuses. Oh, I don't need to pray anymore because you know what? It's just too hard. That person is too far gone. They're never going to change. Or we say, you know, it is what it is. Everything happens for a reason. You know, the world, world likes to throw that one out, right? And so we stop praying. And because we haven't persisted in prayer, then we don't realize, you know, the breakthroughs that we need and that we're praying for. Um, have any of you heard of an author, a speaker, and a prophet? His name is Dutch Sheets. Yeah, many of you have heard of Dutch Sheets. He has this book out, and we have it in the church office, uh, Intercessory Prayer. And he talks about how God um, taught him a lot about praying persistently. He was invited to pray for a, a, a young girl that was sick. Actually, she was more than sick. They told him that she was sick. She was in the hospital. She was more than sick because she had been in a coma for a year and a half. And they asked him to come and pray for her. And the family said that they didn't want to tell him that she had been in a coma for a year and a half because that might have overwhelmed him and maybe he wouldn't have come to pray. And he said they were absolutely right. If he would have known that she was in a coma, he wouldn't have taken that pr prayer assignment on. But he didn't know that. And when he got to the hospital and, she, and he saw her, he was burdened for her. And he prayed and he asked the Lord, do you want me to pray for this? Are you going to heal this young girl? And the Lord said, yes. And so he picked up this prayer assignment to pray for this young girl. But what he wasn't expecting was how long it was going to take to get an answer to his prayer. He said that he prayed three to four hours a week for a whole year before he saw anything. And during that time, he said that he did more crying than he did praying. He was frustrated. He would go down there and he'd sit by her bedside and he would pray and he'd pray this way and he'd pray that way and nothing, nothing changed until after a year had gone by. And after this year of praying, she actually got sick. She developed some kind of septic uh, illness, and they, they transferred her to the hospital. She was in, in, in a senior's home, and they were looking after her there, and they transferred her to the hospital, and they did some tests, and they discovered that she was actually getting worse, and they didn't expect her to live. And so the family called Dutch Sheets and told, you got to come to the hospital. She's probably not going to live the rest of the day. So he went down to the hospital. Before he went into her room, he prayed one more time like he had prayed so many times and said, Lord, are you sure you're going to heal her? And the Lord said, yes, keep praying. And so he went into the hospital room thinking that it could be his last time praying for her. And he said a simple prayer like he always prayed for her. Nothing happened and he left. But three days later, she woke up and she was completely healed. 
And this is what he said in his own words. He said, my persistent was rewarded when three days after that Wednesday in the hospital, Diane woke up with full restoration to her brain. News about the miracle spread to the other nations. In fact, the nursing home where she had stayed received inquiries from Europe wanting to know about her incredible recovery. Every hour and every tear I had invested became worth the wait when I saw Diane awake and heard her speak the words, praise the Lord. So, you know, our prayers aren't always answered the first time, the second time, the first year, the second year, the third year. But we can't take the delay as a sign of denial. We have to persist in prayer. Ask the Lord for a burden because we just don't know when that prayer is going to be answered. And we don't know how much spiritual warfare is surrounding our prayers. And, and we have to make sure that we continue, you know, to pray so that we get the answer that God has burdened us for. And so, you know, when we talk about fasting, we say that fasting is a powerful way, number one, for us to humble ourselves, right? And to deny ourselves the things that we crave so that we can give ourselves more of ourselves to God in prayer. Fasting also reminds us that we are weak we like to get out in the flesh and to control things and try, you know, to make things better or, or just to work things out. But when you fast and realize that there's nothing that you can do to change that situation, it reminds you of just how powerful God is and that he's supernatural and we need a supernatural God on this natural situation. And so in closing, when we commit ourselves to a time of fasting, we need to consider these three things we just talked about. We need to ask the Lord for a burden that will help us to push, to pray until something happens, right? We need to consider our vow and decide exactly what we're willing to give up and how long we're willing to give it up for. And then we need to persist in prayer, knowing that the enemy will probably resist us, but that doesn't mean that he will overwhelm us because God has already conquered us. So we need know that we can come boldly and we can pray and fast confidently knowing that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen? Amen.